From the people picking up millions of pounds of trash a day, to the cleaners who scrub the 9-11 memorial in the dark, and the Queen's bagel makers who start rolling at 3 a.m., we met some of the New York City heroes who keep America's busiest city moving. In Queens, the city's famous Utopia Bagels makes 15,000 bagels a day by hand. It all starts with a 41-year-old dough recipe that uses barley malt. It's a really old school way of doing a bagel. Most stores that make bagels today use brown sugar, but to make a good quality bagel, you need this ingredient. Next, they add salt, and a large scoop of Puratos Bagel Improver. So what that does, it softens the dough inside and it crisps the crust outside. Then they start filling the mixer with New York City tap water, but it has to be at just the right temperature. We tend to use water that's around 60 degrees, 62, 63, but temperatures of the water may change when it's hotter and colder throughout the year. Then it's time to add in 200 pounds of all-purpose flour, a small portion compared to what they have on hand. You're looking at about 7,000 pounds of flour, almost a two-day amount for us that will go through all this flour, and this is actually just one of my mountains of flour. The final ingredient is yeast, but for flavored bagels, the recipe may change slightly to include eggs, sugar, or freeze-dried blueberries, depending on the flavor. There is no set time for when the dough is finished mixing. According to Scott, it takes a keen eye and years of experience. It's a thing called when it's ready. <laughs> How long have you been making bagels? 18 years. 18 years. Daniel's been rolling 18 years. It takes understanding the temperature in the air. It takes understanding his machine that he works with, how long it should mix. All these things are such important factors about what happens with our bagel. Once the dough reaches the desired consistency, it's cut into sections and transferred over to the rolling table, where it's then formed into one large mound. We can make up to 15,000 bagels in a day, and this will make approximately 1,000 bagels. They cover the entire thing with a plastic sheet to help soften the dough before rolling. And it's only about a five minute process that allows that dough to connect a little better with each other. They're saying, hello, how are you? All those ingredients are basically doing that right now. At any given point, there are four expert rollers on hand. These skilled men have between 15 and 27 years of experience perfecting their craft, something Scott says is a dying breed. There's not a school of rolling bagels out there right now, and these people are experts at their field. Listen, I think Derek Jeter said it best. If you put 10,000 hours into something, you're a professional. And Daniel has definitely put 10,000 hours into it. It takes an hour to an hour and a half for these hand rollers to individually slice, roll, and twist about a thousand bagels. It takes a certain type of character because it's very tedious. You're cutting the same thing over and over. And I can tell who is rolling what bagel by the way they lock their bagel and form it together. Daniel has that little lip here that I noticed about Daniel's roll, and then I can see, you know, those were Daniel's bagels. And it gives each bagel their own personality. Our bagels are like snowflakes. Everyone is individually different, and that's what makes it special. Once the bagels are rolled, they're placed on these racks, covered with plastic and left to proof for a half hour. They then move into one of three fridges to ferment for at least 24 hours. What we're going to do now is open these bagels up because we still have to reduce the heat to stop the rising of these bagels. We tend to stop the proofing where a lot of places tend to expand their proofing so that bagels are bigger. There's a misconception that bigger bagels are better. 
and they're not by far. As you see, each rack has approximately a thousand bagels. So you're looking at 10,000, 15,000 bagels right before your eyes. And this is only one of my fridges that we keep the bagels. Here's my second fridge. Again, you have racks of bagels, one, two, three, four. We have close to seven, 8,000 more bagels. So this is basically where we'll keep our everyday making of the bagels. Now it's time for fun and games. We're gonna start baking some bagels. We'll always have two people working the oven. So there's a kettle man, which we'll call him. So he'll control the flow of the bagels into the kettle. And then there's the guy on the oven that will be his director. But the kettle is the ultimate guy in control because he knows when that bagel's ready to come out of that kettle. It's so important. Once the bagels have been properly boiled, they're scooped over to boards that have been pre-seasoned with the appropriate flavors, such as poppy, sesame, or the very popular everything mix. Now are these hot? Yes, they are very hot. But if you watch me, I'm constantly dipping my hand in water to remove some of that heat. Now this again is where we put on both sides. So we're seasoning both boards, both sides. After workers carefully coat each bagel, they move the boards into the oven. Now, why we're putting them on boards? Because if we put these bagels in straight, they would stick to the slate that they're being cooked on. We put six bagels on a board. There's 16 boards that'll go into the oven. We have a Middleby Marshall, a 1947 oven. It is the heart and soul of my business. We're able to produce up to a thousand bagels an hour on it. After a few rotations around the oven, the boards are flipped so the bottom of the bagels can cook evenly. Then they're ready to be pulled and served to customers. See, these are so, look at it, look at the color on this bagel. Look at that beautiful crisp crust. My son always does the knock test, but feel that crisscross? Look at that steam coming out of that bagel. In total, Utopia Bagels offers 30 kinds of bagels and various sandwiches like the bacon, egg and cheese, or the classic lox. 43 staff members make up Utopia Bagels, and they all work like a well-oiled machine to serve the 3,500 customers who visit the shop every week. We're busiest on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. We could have a line lasting for eight hours straight. But you get me crying about my customers, because our fan base is like none other. It's like a landmark. Everybody's been coming here for over 50 years. It's the, like a home place for everybody. It's the atmosphere, it's the people, it's the owner. Everybody's so nice here. And when you come in, you feel welcomed. Everything is good. I've been around to other bagel stores, but there's no place like home. Scott treats you like family when you come here. Utopia Bagels is the best. The most important thing about our bagels is right here. And I get emotional about it, but it's the heart and soul. Every worker here has heart and soul. It truly is something I live for and something we work at. You know, my passion for making people smile with our food and what we produce is a joy for me. It really is. This is Jim. He's cleaning the reflecting pools at the 9-11 Memorial in New York City. Jim and his team are working beneath a 27-foot tall waterfall in near total darkness, vacuuming every inch of the pool. Their goal is to do it without missing a spot. It's a physically demanding job, but that's not the only challenge. I've never actually marked how many miles it is, but you do a few miles in there and it could be humid. It, and you come out of there and uh, you feel like you walked on the moon almost. <laughs> The pools are nearly an acre each, so it would take hours to finish the job before the sun comes up. 
While he works inside the pool, other crew members work on the bronze panels above ground. These routines happen five days a week and are essential for keeping the memorial in pristine condition for the millions who come to pay their respects here. They start by shutting off the waterfalls, and over the next eight hours, Jim and his team work tirelessly to deep clean this pool. The hardest part is, it's, it's a long test. The pool is big, it, it's not a, uh, a swimming pool. You know, it's a 200 by 200 giant pool. I'm gonna pull the hose out and then bring it back. Or whatever. Just, you don't have to use the whole reel. We got too much hose. We usually have three men through the pool, so two guys be in the pool and one guy will be outside running the, the pumps, which collect the uh, debris and return the clean water back to the pool. Once we're set, we're on our way. I go and vacuum generally, and I have whoever's with me that night brushes behind. Come on, hurry up. Sorry. We've got all day here. <laughs> all right. The vacuum will capture most of the debris, and the person brushing will knock up some of the other loose debris that doesn't get caught and it will be caught into like some of our filters that we have running downstairs. Now I'm, I'm trapped in the hose here. I'm gonna trip myself. And we'll be on America's bloopers. <laughs> the workers generally clean out dirt, leaves, and algae from the bottom of the pools. They also remove larger items that visitors drop or throw in. They don't always know what they'll encounter in the pool each night. We find kids' toys, little small items, depends on the, the crowd. One night, I actually found a, a bat in there. And I'm not talking about a baseball bat, I'm talking about a bat. It was pretty wild when it flew away from me when, when I realized I was grabbing a bat. Depending on the cleanliness of the pool, it could take anywhere between six and seven hours. And sometimes if we feel up to it, we could do it a little quicker. Some people treat this place like a uh, wishing well, so we do catch some money. And unfortunately, I think some people, being that it's so far removed from the original 9-11, I think some people are a little uh, uneducated about this place. And some people treat it like it's just a regular fountain and they're throwing garbage in here sometimes too. You know, people have to learn that this isn't your uh, mall fountain. I knew a few of the uh, brokers that passed away. A whole, uh, a whole group of them had a meeting in one of the towers, unfortunately, and uh, except for one, one trader, all of them perished. I, I think about them often because we go up top where the names are and brush near the nameplates, the troughs, and uh, on the north side, they're all, all on one panel. So I see, I see their names just about every day. Total waste of uh, lives that you know, could have been doing good, good in the world now. While Jim and the team finish cleaning the pools below, Ryan is tackling the bronze name panels above. The panels honor the 2,983 victims of the attacks on the World Trade Center, both in 1993 and 2001. Ryan will have to strip the top layer of metal and use a blowtorch to remove a carving someone etched onto the plaque, without damaging the rest of the memorial. This confuses me why you'd want to write something here. For a mark like that, you have to go pretty deep, get all the way down. Otherwise, you can't really get rid of it. If you don't go down far enough, you'll see it when you refinish it. The further down you go, the better. Sometimes I've seen nice things written, but you know, you, you, they don't understand. You, just, you can't just write whatever you want on it. After briefly assessing the damage, Ryan needs to remove the protective bars so he can reach the entire metal surface. To do this, he props up the bars with a wood plank and unhooks the brackets holding up the panels. Whew. Now what I'll do is uh, rub it down with a NAFTA. It's almost like a paint thinner. 
it just kind of takes the wax off so I'm not burning wax. <sighs> if I can open it. <laughs> and it shouldn't take too long once I get the torch on it. There's so much in the prep and then the finishing, the torch is actually not that bad. After sanding down the top layer of panel and neutralizing the wax, Ryan is ready to blowtorch the damaged area to melt the metal in the patina so he can repaint the color layer and restore the panel to its original state. This is what we use. And it's basically just a patina in a solution. Oh, I haven't used you in a while. Prep them. So I'm basically getting up to the right temperature. If it's too cold, it, it'll go on spotty. If it's too hot, it'll kind of evaporate off or it'll get burnt. In the summer months, the longest part of the job is waiting for the burned panel to cool before applying a new layer of wax and an acrylic top coat to finish the restoration process. We're gonna put the acrylic spray on it. It's just kind of like a clear coat helps it kind of adhere a little bit better. The last step really, well, besides buffing the wax off. So I'm just gonna put the wax on real nice, not too hard, not a lot, you don't need a ton. Just put it on lightly. The wax will go over the finish and make it look, once I polish it, it'll look brand new. I've got a little bit of heat, but that's because it's still hot. but it was right here. Now, all Ryan has to do is buff off the excess wax using a white Scotch-Brite pad. And then once it gets smooth, you know you're done. When people do something like that, I wouldn't say it makes me angry. I get it. Some of these people might not have even been alive when it happened or they were too young to get it. My uncle was a New York City firefighter and he was hurt really bad here, but uh, luckily he survived. We got, we got a little lucky. After a strenuous six to seven hours of cleaning, Jim and the team are ready to head out of the pool. By tomorrow morning, a new batch of visitors will see sparkling pools below rushing waterfalls. And most of them won't know that Jim's team was even here. When we uh, finish the pool, most of the time we just, we're just ready to really get out of there. and. Most of our inspection, we, you know, we're fairly confident that we did the proper job. There's always a little fail factor, but, you know, not too bad. My father worked in these buildings almost his whole life. And my father was here for uh, the 93 bombing. And that was before cell phones and everything. And he was, the, he was on the 30th floor of the uh, second tower. When he was there, he was like the floor marshal. He came home full of soot, but he stayed there because there was people that couldn't get down the steps. So he made sure that he stayed with them. So I, I think on 9-11 day, you know, if he was here, uh, we probably would have lost him because he wouldn't have left. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was always so proud of, of the job. I, I probably had chances to do other things in this building, but even if I wanted to do another job, I wouldn't because of him. And, I, and now, you know, I, I love doing it, so I do it. New York City's Department of Sanitation sends its fleet of 2,000 garbage trucks to start picking up at 5 a.m. You have to keep active. Some guys like to work out, some guys don't. Basically, it depends on you. What do you do? Me? I don't work out. This is my workout. This is my daily workout. That's Frank, a 23-year veteran sanitation worker. Well, you get immune to the smell. You don't smell garbage, you smell money. Second to see how solid it is. You can tell when the truck is full. Frank heads to the dump station in the Upper East Side. By then, the sun's coming up. We are currently at 91st Street MTS. Doors will open as the truck comes in, and there's radiation detectors that will read the truck. Trucks pause at the way station to help the city keep track of how much trash New Yorkers produce. Then handles tilt the hopper. Then she'll push the blade, and the blade will push the, the material all the way out to clear the whole truck. It 
It's roughly 450 to 600 tons a day. Tractors move the trash into the containers beneath the ground. It's sort of a dance. One FBL will clear the wall and one FBL will blow containers. Getting the material containerized as quickly as possible and sealed keeps that smell down. A stamper then packs in the garbage. Mattresses are used like a sponge to sop up anything left over. When we have garbage on the floor, it'll take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to load a container. Once the Department of Sanitation seals a container and slides it out to the dock, responsibility then goes to Covanta. The waste energy company handles two marine transfer stations in the city. Containers are picked up by the crane and put on the barge. 48 containers go on the barge. Every one of these containers represents a truckload that we have taken off of the city streets and out of the tunnels, reducing carbon emissions and reducing congestion and wear and tear on the city's infrastructure. A tug attaches to the loaded trash barge. Tug Captain Jason Harris is now in charge. He gets the go-ahead for a 9.30 a.m. departure. What you see here is, is called Hell's Gate. This is the upper end of the East River. Tides play a major factor in the times that we can transfer barges. You can't go against the tide when it's max tide. It's too strong. We would actually come to a dead stop on this boat and barge. You wait until you can go with it. Quite often a barge gets, gets filled up and we will have to wait two, three, maybe four hours before the tide is, is in the favor. He navigates this heavy load safely along one of the busiest waterways in the world down the East River, through New York Harbor to Staten Island. Three hours later, the tug and barge back up into the global transfer station. It is an inherently dangerous operation to move heavy equipment overhead. Then a train takes it to one of Covanta's waste to energy facilities. It can also get there via truck. All of Manhattan's residential trash goes to waste energy facilities like this one to be burned and turned into electricity. This facility processes up to a million tons of waste annually. Once the trucks scale in and come up to the tipping floor, they dump in front of one of these bays. Tractors push the trash into a massive storage pit, 93 feet deep and 270 feet long. Between eight and 9,000 tons are in the refuse pit. It's about three to four days worth of trash. A giant grapple claw descends over the trash. In one swoop, it can pick up as much as one trash truck carries. The claw builds a wall of trash to prevent it from avalanching onto the tipping floor. It also helps to make more space for incoming refuse. Do you look at garbage a very different way since I've been working here? We create a lot of garbage as, as a population. Two claws work together in tandem, dumping trash into hoppers leading to the incinerator. Romeo's an expert giant claw operator. 21 years of playing the crane. There is no shortage of fuel for our boilers. Toy Story is the first thing everyone thinks of. Disney actually got inspiration for the Toy Story 3 incinerator sequence from a Covanta plant. The incinerators burn the trash at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It takes one to two hours to burn an entire hopper load. We've now entered the control room area of the plant. This is the brain of the operation. Yes, it is. <laughs> And here's your brain. He's got camera views of the combustion zone. How important are you for this, this place running correctly? How important am I? I am the guy. <laughs> I, I am the guy. He's in the hot seat. Russell monitors as the furnace heats up steam, turning this turbine and generating enough energy to power this plant and 46,000 homes in the region. After everything's burned, all that's left over is ash and metal. This magnet pulls off enough metal to make 21,000 cars. The leftover ash goes to cover landfills. Next, the plant tackles those nasty fumes that burning trash causes. First, leftover gases go through a scrubber reactor. A lime slurry cleans any acid gases, and activated carbon absorbs pollutants. Then it goes through a baghouse, basically a bunch of filters. So what's left coming out of that smokestack? Constituents of the flue gas is what's in normal air, like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, moisture. The alternative to this would be going to a landfill. Waste to energy does produce CO2 emissions, but in a year, this process eliminates a million tons of CO2 emissions a landfill would have produced. We generate a very small amount of methane. The methane we offset from a landfill results in an actual decrease of CO2 emissions. 
the city hopes to keep moving trash on waterways to facilities like this one. It's all part of its goal of becoming zero waste to landfill by 2030, but that is becoming harder and harder to reach. Only about 30% of New York City's waste turns into energy. The rest ends up in harmful methane-producing landfills as far away as South Carolina and Ohio. And it takes a significant investment to move it. Every year exporting trash costs the city about $400 million. So why does New York City send its trash so far away? In 1881, New York City's streets were notoriously filthy. So dirty, people were getting sick. So the Department of Sanitation was established to clean up the streets. And the department did help mop up the city, but the city quickly ran out of room to put all of its trash. In the early 1900s, the city turned to dumping trash into the ocean. Even though it was illegal, as much as 80% of the city's trash ended up in the sea. This continued until 1934, when a Supreme Court case forced the city to stop ocean dumping. In the 70s, incinerators used for much of the 1900s were closed down because they didn't meet the EPA's clean air standards. So the city opened up landfills across the five boroughs, including at one point, the world's largest. In 1973, New York even built out Lower Manhattan using trash mounds. But even that wasn't enough. With nowhere else to put it, the city began sending its waste to other states. Most of the landfills in this area have been closed down, so the available landfills are getting further and further away. Exporting trash is a costly practice with a big environmental footprint, and it puts the burden on communities far from these shiny skyscrapers. For now, New York City's only choice is to keep exporting the trash. But ultimately, the department says the best solution would be getting New Yorkers to waste less altogether. Trash is like one of those things that you put it outside and forget about it. I think everybody should know what happens to what they get rid of. If you know where it's going and you don't like where it's going, maybe you'll find ways to recycle things. In Lower Manhattan, the city's oldest running deli, Katz's, serves up to 4,000 customers a day. Hey guys, it's Spencer, and I'm outside Katz's Delicatessen. This is one of the most legendary places in New York City. It's been here since 1888, so I'm gonna go try their famous pastrami on rye and see if it lives up to the hype. Katz's Delicatessen has been a New York institution for over 130 years. The old school deli is like a living museum. Not only is it the oldest Jewish deli in New York, but it's one of the only delis of its kind still in operation at all. Coming to Katz's is a, is a throwback. It's a snapshot in time. It's being connected to your parents, to your grandparents, to your great grandparents, to your great great grandparents, because they all came here. We do not believe in changing pretty much anything, from the walls uh, to the neons, to the pictures, to the staff, to the food, to the recipes. We don't really believe in changing it. You come here because you want that nostalgia and that tradition and that food that you know and love. Jewish deli food dates back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when waves of Eastern European Jews immigrated to New York's Lower East Side bringing traditional Eastern European foods, like cured meats and pickled vegetables, along with them. Delis became a meeting ground where tradition blended with new American culture. At one time, kosher-style delis like Katz's were a dime a dozen, but thanks to things like gentrification and changing food trends, Katz's is the only one that's been able to survive the ages. Part of its success is due to exposure. Over the years, Katz's nostalgic setting has been the backdrop for countless movies and TV shows, the most famous of which is Meg Ryan's iconic scene in When Harry Met Sally. The scene with Meg Ryan is one of my favorite scenes in all the movies we've ever seen. So. <laughs> oh, not right now. <laughs> yes! 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 I'll have what she's having. Hollywood fame aside, Katz's success is also thanks to the fact that their food is really just that good. The menu has all the classics you'd expect from a Jewish deli, but most people show up for their legendary pastrami and corned beef. 
Can you describe uh, what their pastrami tastes like to me? Heaven. It's the only place in the world to get a pastrami sandwich. I mean, I wouldn't have it any place else. It's about treating these pieces of meat like you would a child and knowing what to do with it and how to take care of it from start to finish. That makes us so special. We cook it longer than anyone else. We cook it so long that it, it would fall apart if you tried to put it in a slicer. So it's so juicy, so tender that you have to carve it by hand. Their hand-sliced approach means each sandwich is expertly carved to order. To keep the crowds moving, Katz's is set up with multiple carvers at multiple counters. And let's just say, you better be prepared to order when you get in line. So when you walk in, you're gonna get a ticket. That's our system. We've been doing it the same way for 131 years. Feed me. Be prepared, because if you get all the way to the front of the line and don't know what you want, you're gonna get yelled at. Uh, I would like pastrami on rye. But you already know what you want. You want a pastrami, you want some latkes, you want some matzo ball soup, you're good. No problem, don't worry about it. So that was the easy part. Finding a seat is the hard part. Uh, I don't know. I might have to eat it standing up, which I would. Uh, so we have here the pastrami, mm -hmm. uh, just classic, juicy, perfect, fantastic. You can't go wrong. Do you have any tips for digging into this monster of a sandwich? Just do it. Just embrace it. Just go for it? Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Mm. Oh my god. <laughs> go for it. I mean, not me. All right. That is unreal. Oh, good. Oh, man. Hit me one of those napkins. I gotta fix my face. <laughs> so, this is the juiciest pastrami I've ever had. Thank you. That's... How is that possible? <laughs> 131 years of practice, that's how it's possible. All right, there you go. <laughs> Eating that sandwich was a religious experience. I'm talking mouth-watering perfection. Even still, it almost took a back seat to the actual experience of just being in that noisy, chaotic room, literally surrounded by Katz's history photos from everyone who's come before, and signs from a near-forgotten era. All of it a reminder that Katz's will always be here for you, just as it always has. Timeless, in a city barreling toward the future. There's nothing like nostalgia. I mean, there's nothing more powerful than, than those traditions. I can't believe that this is my life and, and this is what we get to do for a living is to preserve a tradition and make people happy, hopefully. Um, so it's, it's humbling and it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. Roosevelt Island, the tiny sliver of land between Manhattan and Queens in New York City, has been shooting its trash through tubes for nearly 50 years. This was supposed to be the future of garbage. No more curbside bags, giant trucks, and vermin. Dozens of European cities have systems like this built into their infrastructure. So how did Disney's magical trash tubes end up on a tiny island in the middle of New York City? And why hasn't the system taken off in the US? Pneumatic tubes date back to the early 1800s. They essentially work like giant vacuums, using compressed air to move objects from place to place. Over the following decades, cities across the world began using tubes to deliver mail, as well as medical supplies, banknotes, and at one point, even McDonald's. But the idea was always to move people, like in the Jetsons. Oh boy. By 1870, Alfred Eli Beach developed the first subway in New York City using pneumatic power. It only traveled the length of a city block and was more of a proof of concept than anything else. 
When Roosevelt Island first opened its doors to residents in 1975, developers had a unique opportunity to experiment with a new kind of waste management. Previously, the island was home to a notorious mental health institution, a smallpox hospital, and a prison. This penitentiary is by far the worst in the United States. The island needed an image overhaul and a solution to trash disposal. At the time, New York City sanitation workers were on a nine-day strike. More than a week went by with no garbage pickups, and people were rioting. The system was inspired by the one in Disney World's Magic Kingdom. It was installed just a few years earlier and is still in use today. So, how do they work? This is Roosevelt Island's AVAC facility. Uh, automated vacuum assisted collection process is, is really what it is. Larry Carrick has worked as the island's senior stationary engineer since 2018. And there's a lot to look after. 1974, I believe this was all put in and operational. This is still functional uh, for the most part. So yesterday was a 17 hour work day. You know, it's part of the job. Every day, about eight tons of trash run through these tubes. Eventually, it all gets compressed into these containers. The city's Department of Sanitation sends special trucks to pick them up three times a day, along with containers filled with recyclables and bulk items too big for the island's AVAC system. The trash goes to a transfer station in Queens. There, it mingles with garbage from the rest of the city and is sent to landfills or incinerators that burn trash to make energy. The AVAC system doesn't solve the issue of where our trash ends up, but it does make the process of how it gets there a whole lot cleaner. All of this happens out of sight for the 11,000 people who live on the island. I've been here for five years. I found out about two, two weeks ago. But the AVAC system is far from perfect. Decades of wear and tear have left the pipes prone to jams and leaks, especially when residents don't understand what the system can handle. Anything you could think of as far as crazy hockey sticks. Somebody threw a bed frame in there. A bunch of carpeting, backpacks. And then I've heard about the infamous mattress and the infamous drawer. Goes around. <laughs> so it's something to laugh at. Fixing these jams requires some creative solutions. So this basically spins when we have the handle on it or a machine. Hopefully it grabs into whatever is, is the jam and we're able to pierce through the garbage. Once we get this in good, we try to rip it out. When it comes to bigger repairs, someone has to crawl inside. And these tubes are only 18 inches in diameter. If there's a leak on some of the pipe, we'll have a gentleman that'll actually climb into this area. He gets onto a skateboard along with some welding equipment and he'll end up skating in here so we can weld up the hold it's, itself. It's a very simple, intuitive, easy process to use when it works. When it doesn't work, it stinks. But despite the occasional breakdown, many residents prefer it to traditional trash collection. Judith Birdie moved here in 1977, two years after it opened to residents. And as president of the Roosevelt Island Historical Society, she literally wrote the book on it. Oh, what a wonderful book. I think I'll read it. She said she couldn't imagine trash collection any other way. There's no way I want a traditional garbage pickup. <laughs> I love it that we don't have trash on the street. You don't see a rat anywhere to be found on this place. In other parts of the world, AVAC systems have a more modern touch. In Norway, these different cans separate trash from recycling. And in Sweden and Spain, some are even fully automated. So why can't Americans just stuff their trash down the tube? The main reason, of course, is money. Maintaining these systems is complicated and expensive. Also, private developers don't really have any incentive to invest in this kind of infrastructure. One of the guys who builds these systems compares it to a sewer line. How many times you have to flush the loo in your apartment to amortize that investment, right? It's a basic service you have at your house. And installing them is messy, if not impossible. It involves tearing down buildings to lay the pipes below ground. That's especially tricky in New York City. Manhattan has a huge complex underground. Things like the subway system, gas lines, electric pipelines, 
that it would be essentially impossible to implement an AVAC system like the one we have here. But at the Polo Grounds in Harlem, New York City's housing authority is giving it a shot. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. For dense buildings and, and for high-rise buildings, pneumatic collection can really save a lot of room on the curb. This will be the first time in half a century that an AVAC system will be installed in the city. The project will cost an estimated $31 million and will service 4,000 residents across four different buildings. It's expected to be completed by summer 2024. If the project works, it could serve as a model for the rest of the city and the country. A Swedish company called Envac designed the Roosevelt and Disney systems, and it's looking to expand its American footprint. We really think there's a huge potential market in the U.S. It's still a long path. We know it is not going to be easy. Roosevelt Island might not be the trashless utopia we were promised decades ago, but advancements in AVAC could lead us to rethink how we dispose of our waste and the infrastructure behind it. Someone's got to take the time. Someone has to have the technology. Around here, this can continue. Someone has to continue to put money into upgrades and producing positive things. Pat LaFrieda Meat Purveyors supplies thousands of restaurants from New York to Las Vegas. It has the largest dry aging room in the world. One family has run this business for over a century, and Pat is the third generation owner. Right now, there's well over $10 million of meat in here. He brought in a whole new approach to the business, selling high-end meat to both fancy restaurants, but also to burger chains like Shake Shack. Pat's team produces 250,000 pounds of meat every night. It's kind of like um, Jenga, where you're moving one piece and another piece comes in. It takes years to develop an army like we have. Their weapons? butcher's knives, band saws, and meat grinders. So how does Pat LaFrieda manage to supply everything from $3 smash burgers to $200 steaks? And how did he turn a humble butcher shop into a $270 million meat empire? Pat only buys prime and choice beef, the highest USDA grades. These cuts have the most marbling, which adds flavor. So how does all this pricey steak get to kitchens? Chefs normally know what they want to order or what they need to order after that dinner serving. And then they really want the product delivered the next morning, a few hours later. That's why shifts here start around 6 p.m. And then it's a race against the clock. Some kitchens need these steaks by the following morning. The only way to work through the night is, is to have cohesion. As a former, former military guy myself, you know, building that team, it takes time. Many steaks start in this dry aging room, which holds 15,000 of Pat's finest cuts. It has to stay at 36 degrees Fahrenheit and 80% humidity. Otherwise, everything will spoil or freeze, and Pat could lose millions. As the meat ages, moisture evaporates, and muscles break down. But we know that the dry aging process is working when we see that the protein has sunken in from the bone and the fat. Workers wheel the meat to the portioning section. Master butchers go to work on everything from tomahawk steaks to New York strips, slicing them exactly the way each restaurant wants. Pat trained most of these butchers himself. The ones you made this morning were beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah, Pat. There really are no butcher schools. Our restaurants will ask me, Pat, where do you get your butchers from? I'm like, we don't get our butchers, we make our butchers. They only need a few tools to get the job done. In most people's hands, you're gonna see boning knives. With this, you can basically do the whole job um, until you get to cutting the steak across and that's where you want a scimitar knife. And what makes this a butcher knife as opposed to a chef's knife? We have a, a protective corner. But certain cuts require using a bandsaw. It's ideal for slicing through bone or doing high volume orders as fast as possible. And only master butchers can operate them. It's probably a good two and a half years before they would even get to a bandsaw. 
Next, workers load everything onto trucks. If a customer is local, Pat's team can deliver within a few hours. The Press Club Grill in New York City gets thousands of pounds of meat from La Frida per week. Owner and chef Franklin Becker showed us how he prepares a boneless ribeye. Yeah, I try to season it fairly aggressively, okay, and uh, let all that salt kind of penetrate into the pores of the meat. And then I'm going on to an infrared broiler. This steak doesn't take long. It's pretty quick. In just five to six minutes, you'll get a juicy medium rare. So you see that fat starting to caramelize, okay? If you let it rest, then the meat's gonna kind of reabsorb all those juices. And when you slice it, there's gonna be nothing left really on the board. That's when a steak is perfectly rested. That's when you know that you've cooked it right. One of the most legendary steakhouses in New York City, Peter Luger, has been sourcing meat cuts from La Frida since 1998. Peter Luger has garnered its reputation as a New York City institution, frankly due to a lot of hard work. And I think it starts with our attention to detail in selecting each piece of meat that comes into this restaurant. We're really about letting the highest quality steak we can buy shine with just a little salt and a tiny bit of butter. We cook the steak to order and we send it out sizzling hot to the guy. That's it. But La Frida doesn't just supply fancy restaurants. Back in 2004, Pat bought the company's first burger machine to make patties for a new fast casual chain that was about to open, Shake Shack. Pat created a special blend without trimmings or added fat for the new chain. Shake Shack still uses Pat's recipes today, and La Frida still supplies patties for more than 100 of its locations. Every burger starts on the main floor. 2,000 pounds of Angus beef are dumped onto conveyor belts. Machines spray them with diluted vinegar that kills potential germs. Other machines grind and mix the meat. The ground meat goes into patty forming machines which can make 200 different blends. Workers need to move fast. The company pumps out over 200,000 burgers a day. It gets pretty uh, hectic and frustrating sometimes when it gets overloaded, but um, every single day is just a different challenge. Mel's Butcher Box in Tenafly, New Jersey, is one of Pat's loyal customers. Owner Melanie Landano orders up to 100 pounds of burgers from him a day. For the restaurant, we use the original Pat LaFrida blend, which is a short rib brisket blend. For special events, if a customer requests dry-aged brisket burgers, we get that. Some people request a 45-day dry-aged burger. We, um, anything I want, Pat will make for us. Once we put it on the grill, we leave it on the grill. And a lot of people like to press on, press on the meat, then all the juices come out. I, what I do, I flip it once, I leave it and let it cook, and then I, hold, I let it rest here. On top of her daily customers, Mel also cooks burgers for four local schools. On Monday morning alone, she grills over 200 patties for students. So today we're probably going to cook uh, five or six cases in one hour. So it's Burger Palooza. Mel also buys La Frida skirt steaks, ribeye cheese steaks, and meatballs. Here's our La Frida meatballs. This is going with this penne meatball, just heating up. This is uh, his grandfather's recipe, and they're de delicious. I'm Italian, so I don't use any other, any other meatball but Pat LaFrida meatball, if I have no time to make my own, so. <laughs> Family recipes are still an important part of LaFrida's. Pat's great-grandfather opened a Brooklyn butcher shop in 1922. After moving the operation to Manhattan's growing meatpacking district, Pat's grandfather took over and started Pat LaFrida Meat Purveyors. Pat started learning the job as a child. My favorite times were cutting meat with my grandfather to my left and my dad to my right. But Pat's father insisted his son try a different career first. He didn't want me to work those hours. Um, he didn't want me in that environment. 
Pat spent nine months working as a stockbroker, but then ditched that job to join the family business. A decade later, Pat would be named CEO. And now my dad can't wait for my son to go off to college and come back and run the family business. When Pat joined in 1994, the company had 44 restaurant customers. Now, they have 1,600 and are posting annual sales of $270 million. We are several hundred times larger than we were. In 2021, Pat opened this new $20 million facility. To keep such a massive operation running, Pat has to be more than a manager, though. He does everything. He comes, works in production, he works with us, he goes on the table, he goes to see customers, he oversees everything. It's something I love to do, and I do a lot of my best thinking while I'm cutting meat. Um, to me, it's a, it's a relaxing time. Even after this much growth, Pat thinks there's room for more. This facility produces about 250,000 pounds of product a night and with the capacity to probably triple or quadruple that. So we built it with the space to, to be able to uh, expand from there. If you flew into JFK in the 90s, getting something into the US was a lot easier. But after 9-11, a conversation started about how to protect the country from dangerous foods, drugs, and people. And US Customs and Border Protection as it's known today, was formed. You'll generally see two kinds of CBP officials at airports, officers like Steve and agriculture specialists like Ginger. Their job is to find, seize, and destroy millions of items each year that don't belong in the United States. It's a big job, and sometimes it requires a sidekick. A sidekick on four legs. This is K9 Spike. Look, Spike. He is a eight-year-old. Belgian Malawa. I've been his only handler from day one. He's trained in narcotics. During the duration of our career, probably sees over 400 different seizures. CBP officials like Steve identify high-risk individuals trying to enter into the U.S., as well as drugs and firearms. And because these are such high stakes, dogs like Spike are trained in a special way, in what's called passive response, meaning if they sniff out drugs, they don't scratch, they don't bark, and they don't make a scene. They sit. And if they're right, the dog gets rewarded. His reward is actually this toy right here. So he likes to play. So, ain't that right? You like to play. You like to play. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Let me see it. Let me see it. Here at the port, we've caught up to 16 keys of ecstasy recently. Narcotics are then seized and sent to be incinerated. The incinerator's location is kept a secret, as a matter of national security. Now, pretty much everyone knows that narcotics aren't allowed through U.S. borders. But actually, drugs aren't the most commonly seized item at JFK. Food is. When a regular traveler arrives in the U.S., they're required to declare any food items they're bringing in, or face up to a $1,000 fine for the first offense. These items aren't taken because agents want to eat your yummy Spanish ham or Caribbean mangoes. It's because agents are responsible for protecting American agriculture from any foreign pests or diseases that could affect our livestock or crops. And that's where agricultural specialists like Ginger come in. Everything gets destroyed to protect against that pest risk. We are protecting the country's agricultural interests. We're protecting against bioterrorism, where someone could intentionally try to bring in items to wreak havoc in this country. Foreign bugs hitchhiking in luggage have wreaked havoc in the U.S. before. Florida's orange and grapefruit growers lost $2.9 billion from 2007 to 2014, thanks to the Asian citrus psyllid. And since being introduced into the U.S. in the 90s, the Asian longhorn beetle has ravaged hardwood trees. Eradication efforts between 1997 and 2010 cost more than $373 million. In our country, we go into the grocery store and the food is always there. We don't have to look at it for holes or check if it's got some disease on it. It always looks great. So we get kind of spoiled and we don't really understand the importance of, of protecting that. So it's crucial that even a single stowaway orange is found and confiscated. But with 34 million annual international passengers to and from JFK, going through each of those bags can seem pretty impossible. 
for humans, that is. Luckily, they've got a little help from the Beagle Brigade. This four-legged officer is Biscuit, and like Spike, Biscuit is trained in passive response. But Biscuit's trained to sniff out food, rather than drugs. They actually learn. They start out with five target olders, and then over the years, he'll expand. And they retire with sometimes like 150 olders that they know. And Biscuit's pretty good at sniffing. These beagles have an estimated 90% accuracy rate. Watching your dog sit on three grapes in a Samsonite hard side suitcase is just incredible. Scientists say their nose is a thousand times stronger than ours, and they prove it every single day. Once Biscuit sniffs out an item, the passenger in question and their bags go to Ginger, who will x-ray and search the luggage. Okay, these are both your bags, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you pack everything yourselves? Okay. You pack your bags yourself? Okay. Ginger unzips the bag and searches each one by hand. And if she finds something that's not allowed, it's seized and held in temporary bins. This is very common from that region. Once you open it all up, you have grape leaves. These are horse meat sausages. This is another very good example of what we get very frequently, especially in the springtime. This is a plant that they're planning on bringing here to grow. So anything for propagation has additional entry requirements. So this is two families worth <laughs> from one flight. JFK disposes of the contraband food in one of two ways, the grinder or the incinerator. Ginger will bag up the seized items and label them based on their final destination. So we're gonna go walk this bin, nice and full from those two passengers, down to our contraband room. This is the room where illicit food meets its end. This is our grinding machine. This is what we'll generally use for fruits, vegetables, that kind of commodities. It is called the Muffin Monster. But before Ginger can send a piece of fruit down the Muffin Monster, she cuts it open, squishes it, and inspects it. She's looking for evidence of diseases, insertion points for insects, and exit points for larvae. If she finds a little bug, like this one, she neutralizes the pest risk and sends it to the U.S. Department of Agriculture for further investigation. Now it's back to the muffin monster. 120 pounds of food are grinded up each day from arriving international passengers. Avocados, mangoes, and citrus are among the most common fruits that end up in the grinder. We do get messy. It's important to dispose of it properly. I love to eat as much as everybody else. I am a big fan of food, but I know the importance of making sure that what we seized because of established risks is disposed of properly to prevent it from causing problems. So the next time you've got an orange tucked into your luggage, declare it and let experts like Ginger decide if it's admissible and leave the Serrano ham in Spain because Biscuit will find it. This guitar might look like a real Gibson, but it's not. This is coming from China. And wait, it's and it's Gibson, S-O-N, not S-U-N. These are fake too. Coach bag with a Michael Kors zipper. Ooh, we have Nike sneakers here. They're a part of a huge counterfeit industry worth over a trillion dollars. And since these fakes come through the mail, Customs and Border Protection officers are tasked with seizing them. In 2020 alone, CBP seized over 26,000 counterfeit goods shipments. The knockoffs are getting better and better and more profitable for these counterfeiters. Not only are these fake products dangerous for consumers. They've had cadmium, arsenic, lead, and cyanide inside makeup, and it's disfigured people. Perfume has had horse urine in it. Profits of counterfeits are known to fund criminal activity, including attacks and bombings. People think it's a victimless crime. Oh, what's the harm? I'm just buying this pocketbook. What could it do? It does a lot because the problem is where the money is going. And as everything is now sold online, buying counterfeit goods is getting easier. But stopping them is much harder. It's like whack-a-mole. They come up, you go after them, they come down, they go up again. And here we have a counterfeit watch. That's Customs Officer Steve Nethersall. He's America's first line of defense against counterfeits. I've had many million dollar watch seizures. We visited him at JFK to learn how he's spotting and stopping fakes, all while the counterfeit market is surging. Counterfeit goods are anything that infringes on a company's intellectual property rights, or IPR. Think fake Air Jordans, Rolexes, or Louis Vuitton purses. 
And because these products are trademarked, counterfeiting them is illegal. You can just be guaranteed that your product is going to get counterfeited. It's just a matter of time. Half of the counterfeit goods CBP seized in 2019 came through the mail from China, followed by Hong Kong and Singapore. Before a package ever lands in the U.S., CBP gathers intelligence on the sender, container, and aircraft. Using this intel and x-ray machines, CBP narrows down a million packages into the ones that'll get pulled for further inspection. Those suspicious packages will go straight to Steve. He'll start by looking at the box. Well, I'm looking because I don't have my glasses on, so I'm cheating. The first, when it comes in, is the country of origin. Louis Vuitton, they're coming from France. The watch is coming from Switzerland. When it's coming from China, bing, that's your number one red flag. Then you look at the dilapidated boxes. Then he'll open up the package. And this is from a familiar sender that sends counterfeit items, possibly footwear. Ooh. We have Nike sneakers here. This is obviously to save space, but this is not traditional of the manufacturer to crush all these items. We try and take care when we open it up so that if it is something that's legitimate, we'll tape it up and put it back the way it originally was. But that's rare. More than likely, what he finds is fake. The most common counterfeited handbag is Louis Vuitton. The most counterfeited sneaker is Nike Air Jordans. Here we have a Rolex watch. But how does he know they're counterfeits? Well, brands train Steve on the telltale signs to spot a fake. They'll sometimes send a kit, and the kit will include a genuine product. It will include a kind of a hit list as to what to look for. Most of the hit list is kept top secret to protect the brand against counterfeiters. But Steve could share a few things. Rolex would never put their watches in little Ziploc bags. They don't put these inside it, the silica gel. Rolex does not send to individuals in the United States. They only send to their retail stores. I have another package here. This one's coming from Thailand. We have an assortment of items here. We have Chanel eyewear. We have Gucci eyewear, watches, jewelry, Louis Vuitton pouch. High-end manufacturers like this never co-mingle their products. In other words, a Gucci inside a Fendi or a Louis Vuitton. These people will stuff watches, a wallet inside a handbag. They don't put any of this in it, the filler inside it. And their items wouldn't come in bubble wrap like this. Some of the counterfeits are obvious. Here we have a Burberry coat, and it says Burbelly mistakenly on the button. But some aren't as easy to spot. The quality is getting better. Sometimes these factories, especially in China, it's the same factory that's making the good for the brand owner is also making the counterfeits. And that's a real problem for the luxury brand owners. Sometimes the brands themselves can't even tell the difference. Some of the counterfeits are that good. I've never seen one like this before, so of course I'm going to be delicate with it. The packaging and the brand doesn't look like the normal counterfeit that we normally see. It's coming from Israel. What is the country of manufacture for Paul Reed Smith? Seoul, South Korea. Israel is not a manufacturer. There are a lot of red flags. It's like half and half. It's got model code serial number, UPC number. But for co the country that it's coming from is the thing that's throwing me off. So I'm going to put it over here on hold and it'll be determined later on. But in order for Steve to seize anything, there has to be a trademark on that product. Let's see what we got in here. Shirts. Yes, it's all Suzuki shirts. Suzuki has motorcycle and car trademark, but not on apparel. So this will end up being released. But whether it's a copycat of a product that's trademarked or not, counterfeits can be dangerous. That fake makeup? Well, it can cause rashes, swellings, and burns. They've had cadmium, arsenic, lead, and cyanide inside makeup, and it's disfigured people. Cadmium is in rechargeable batteries and control rods in nuclear reactors. Perfume. They've laboratory tested shown there's been horse urine in it. Steve says fake safety equipment is even more alarming. When it comes to automotive parts, that's a very big danger. Spark plugs, which can cause the engine to go on fire. Oil filters that cause instant damage to the engine. Airbags are a big thing. That's something that you may not necessarily realize is something to even consider until you need that airbag and it doesn't go off in the protective way that it should. Counterfeit manufacturers have no regard to health or safety or who they hurt along the way. All they're concerned about is the bottom line. 
Many studies have shown that counterfeiting is one way criminal organizations fund themselves. The accused group in the 2004 Madrid train bombing sold fake CDs to partially finance their attacks. For the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, co-conspirators in that sold counterfeit t-shirts on Broadway to fund that. The two brothers behind the 2015 attack on the Charlie Hebdo publication that killed 12 people and injured 11, they funded their weapons partly through counterfeit Nike sneakers. And sometimes it's hard to make that connection between the purse you might have bought on the street corner and organized crime activity. But this activity that seems to be going under the radar can be lucrative for criminals. And it's because it's high profit and low risk. So when Steve finds a counterfeit good, he seizes it. Then he figures out the item's MSRP, using the brand's website and CBP's internal database. This one here would be about $11,000. That's the MSRP, what the manufacturer would be losing had this been genuine. These are generally on the internet for about $200. In 2020, CBP seized over 26,000 packages for intellectual property rights violations. That's a total value of over a billion dollars. But it's not just the manufacturer's profits that take a hit, their reputations do. When a buyer doesn't know they've bought a knockoff and it falls apart, it's the real company that customer blames. And over time, consumers' trust in the brand is eroded. Steve does all the paperwork for every seized package. Then he stores the goods. Here we have a post on full of seizures, so it's gonna go into the storage room. In the end, all these products will be destroyed. They're incinerated at a top secret location. So what happens to the counterfeiters? For one, Homeland Security investigations can decide to open up a case. But Steve says that doesn't happen often. The first problem? The HSI agents, there's only so many of them. They're gonna deal with the most important thing, which is narcotics. All the fentanyl and the cocaine that, come that are killing people. That is a top priority, and it should be. And the second problem? The nature of counterfeiting is that these bad actors operate without uh, respectful borders. It's oftentimes very difficult to actually get an individual because they're not located in the U.S. American authorities don't have jurisdiction in China, where a lot of counterfeits are made. So arresting counterfeiters within the U.S. is hard. In 2020, Homeland Security investigations arrested 203 people for counterfeiting. Of those, just 93 were convicted. Diane says a more successful tactic is going after counterfeiters online, Many sell their copycat products on platforms like Amazon, Alibaba, and eBay. To fight the fakes, online retailers have launched anti-counterfeiting measures. A lot of these marketplaces are really working with brand owners. We do not want to be a place where a customer purchases an item that ultimately could impact their health and safety. Amazon's program is called Project Zero. When companies register for Amazon, they give information on their brands, trademarks, and listings. Using this data, Amazon's algorithm scans 5 billion products a day for signs of counterfeiting. It looks for things like blurry product photos, copycat product descriptions. Payment information. We look at price point. We look at reviews. And if a listing turns out to be a counterfeit, Amazon will suspend the account. In 2019, Amazon blocked 6 billion suspected bad listings on its site. We might suspend funds. We might quarantine inventory. Then Amazon's new counterfeit crimes unit takes over. Formed in 2020, the unit's made up of former FBI, Homeland Security agents, and federal prosecutors, like Kibaru. Whenever a counterfeit is identified, Kibaru's team will send a packet of information to law enforcement. This information can consist of IP addresses, banking information, email addresses that help us identify the person behind the computer. And to skirt the jurisdiction problem, the unit sends data to agencies all over the world. To Europol, Canadian law enforcement, we partner and work with law enforcement on the ground in China. Local law enforcement does react when a brand owner comes to them and wants to do a raid. And I've been involved in quite a few of them where they're really successful. And we can then decide whether we want to pursue a civil suit or if we want to pursue a criminal enforcement action against them. But even if counterfeiters are caught, sentences tend to be low. For counterfeiting, offenders could face 10 years in prison. Compare that to, say, drug trafficking, where punishment can range from 20 years to life in prison, all the way up to a death sentence. And counterfeiters are getting creative and making their products seem legitimate, from creating fake Amazon listings to flooding the U.S. trademark office with phony applications. It is frustrating that it doesn't stop, that every day there's new infringements that we uncover for clients. And it's all led to a surging industry for counterfeits. 
Today, it makes up 3.3% of global trade. When counterfeits are being sold, oftentimes taxes aren't being paid for those goods, and they in turn can impact economies as well. By 2022, the counterfeits industry is expected to suck $4.2 trillion from the global economy, and it could endanger over 5 million legitimate jobs. Because we're dealing with a moving target, it's a challenging crime problem to address. It grows every day, and it's because of consumer demand. People need to be educated more about the dangers. And the old saying, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. In Brooklyn, Grimaldi's Pizza goes through 200 pounds of mozzarella cheese a day to feed hungry New Yorkers. At 9 in the morning, Tony and his team get started making a 33-year-old dough recipe. The mixer is loaded with olive oil, New York City tap water, activated yeast, and 50 pounds of high-gluten flour. So we have it preset for five minutes. It's on a low spin cycle, okay? And what we do is we sprinkle salt on top of our flour. Five minutes later, we have our famous dough recipe. Once mixed, the dough needs to be cut, weighed, and shaped into bowls within 30 minutes so it doesn't rise. For this, Tony relies on the most experienced pizzaiolos at Grimaldi's. They're cutting each and everything to the same size every day. It's almost like muscle memory at this point where the scale is not even needed. You know, they know what they're doing and it's almost like a healthy competition down here to race. Like, let's go, come on, keep up with me, I'm rolling. You gotta cut faster, let's go. Another skill that's hard to master is rolling the perfect dough bowl. So we're rolling the dough and we're making sure that it's a smooth outer layer as well as making sure that there's no air inside. So for example, you know, if you're rolling it and you're just gonna meatball it and you're just gonna put it like this down, it's gonna rise and it's gonna thin out the middle. And then the pizza, when you pick it up, that's when it flops down. So Grimaldi is known for a nice hard layer crust that is the texture, it's the base, it's the most important thing to the pizza. It's, you know, the foundation to the house. No, no foundation, no pizza. This batch of dough is enough to make 65 to 75 pizzas, which is just a fraction of what will be needed for the day. Once all of the trays are filled, they're taken across the hall to these fridges. So this is only the dough that was made last night, okay? So this is getting ready for our first few hours in Grimaldi's, and then we'll start fresh, probably go through the first batch that we made today, and then a well as another eight or nine for the night shift. In 2011, Grimaldi's moved into its current location. The double-story Palazzo building on number one Front Street was originally built to be Brooklyn's first safety deposit company. Now, Grimaldi's fridges sit in the same place as the old vaults. So I think that's really cool that we made them into uh, our own vaults. So basically, it protects our gold, and this is our gold right here. Next, it's time to make the sauce. Large cans of San Marzano tomatoes are poured into buckets, topped with sugar, and blended. For us, we use a one-day shelf life, so we're just trying to keep it marinating for a few hours, if not a full day, and it's going right onto our pizza. So we like to keep it as fresh as possible. It's nice, thick, and imported tomatoes. Grimaldi's goes through about 700 quarts of tomatoes every week, or roughly 662.4 liters. Upstairs, 200 mozzarella bowls are cut into thin strips, a process that's gone unchanged since opening. The Grimaldi's cheese is very special. It's made only for Grimaldi's, so nowhere else in the world can get our flavor profile that we're doing on our mozzarella. It is a low moisture, low sodium, UV dried fresh mozzarella, so it can withstand the high intense heat of our oven and be cooked and melt to perfection in a short amount of time. By the end of the week, Grimaldi's will hand slice around 2,000 pounds of mozzarella. An hour before opening, Grimaldi's restocks its coal so they can relight the oven. Okay, so right now he's throwing 40 pound bags of anthracite coal into the bottom of our oven chute right over here. So we keep about anywhere from 10 to 12 bags down there at a time. And what we're doing is for at least a day or more, we try and dry out our coal to make sure that it's burning a little cleaner 
easier. It's not popping from the inside, you know, on top of pizzas, et cetera, as it starts to heat up. It makes our stoking process and our oven heat up a little bit quicker too. The pizzeria keeps embers in the brick oven overnight, so it stays warm. So right now we have a grate inside of our oven. It's holding our coal up, but he's right now flipping it and getting rid of all the old coal. The reason why we don't clean it out at nighttime because we want to make sure that it stays warm overnight because it's going to take too many hours to heat up our floor. When the charcoal ignites, the team begins shoveling 200 pounds of coal into the side of the oven. Compared to wood, anthracite coal burns longer, hotter and with less smoke. You can't get a gas oven or a wood oven up to a thousand degrees the way we can. So we're able to get a different, not only flavor profile from the coal, but we're also getting a different profile from the heat and intensity that that pizza is going under. When the doors open at 11.30 a.m., it's all hands on deck to fill orders. To be an official Grimaldi's pie, it needs to be made a certain way. And like most pizzerias, Grimaldi's built its pizza cheese first. Slices of mozzarella are evenly placed around the dough and the gaps are then filled with sauce. So when it melts together, you're seeing a little bit of both, but you're also getting a bite of not too much sauce, not too much cheese. So that's what we're looking for with Grimaldi's. Specialty toppings range from hand-pinched Italian sausage to thinly sliced prosciutto and artichokes. And most pies are finished off with a sprinkling of the Grimaldi's Romano blend, extra virgin olive oil and a few pieces of fresh basil. To help streamline the cooking process, Grimaldi's uses a two-shelf system. So we have a pre-stretch and then a stretching and cheese section on this side. We're pre-stretching cheese in, throwing them on the first shelf right here. Everyone standing on this side is a topper, so that means they're putting on the toppings and the sauce on, they're finishing it off with the olive oil, the basil, and then finishing it off by putting it on the top shelf. The top shelf is so the oven guy knows that they're ready to go in the oven. Working a coal oven takes years of experience to master. From memorizing cook times to keeping a consistent heat, it's not easy to make a perfect pie. So what we're doing is we're loading them in, we're closing the door right away, we're giving it a pop of heat to the bottom of the pizza so we can actually move it around without ripping it or anything like that. What's rare about Brooklyn is that we use this copper stick right here. You know, it's very important with this high heat if you're using a wooden stick. They're just breaking and wearing and tearing and drying out nonstop, especially when you're picking up a heavy pizza. So you can see it's only been about 60 seconds and they're already rising up. So basically I'm making sure that I can pick them up, give them a small spin, and then I'm actually just moving them into position right here. The high heat means that the pizzas only need a few minutes to cook. Water in the dough evaporates quickly, creating air bubbles and leaving behind a light, airy texture in the crust while charcoal gives the pizza a charred, slightly smoky flavor and a crunchy texture. Outside, people begin queuing and waiting up to an hour to get a table. And 16 minutes after opening, the first and third stories of the restaurant are practically full. On the dining floor, you'll find servers with over 20 years of experience and a good sense of humor. Oh, mommy, I'm hungry. Boom. You got it, Papa. While Grimaldi's has an established clientele, a vast majority of its business comes from tour groups. Since 2005, Tony Muya, who runs Pizza Tours, has been coming to showcase Grimaldi's pizza. So if I can describe Grimaldi's in three words, um, it would probably be legendary, authentic, and beloved, because people love Grimaldi's. The key to making a great pizza is passion. It's love. You take dough, cheese, or sauce by itself, it's just simple objects. But when you're building a pizza, it's a piece of art. So for us, and for myself, it's the passion and love I put into every pizza that makes it special. The iconic Rockefeller tree didn't come from a Christmas tree farm. It came from someone's backyard, here in Oneana, New York. This year's tree is an 80-year-old Norway spruce, found in Al Dick's yard, 
Tree 75 feet tall, 45 feet wide, and about 11 tons. I found this tree back in 2016. The head gardener for Rockville Center happened to be riding down the road and he saw the tree. Eric stopped by Al's general store to see if Al and his family would donate their tree to Rockefeller Center. He asked me if we could do it, and we said sure. But they had to wait a few years. It wasn't tall enough when they first saw it. wasn't tall enough. They had to grow a little. I've been looking at it for a couple of years. I watered it. I fed it over a couple of years. And then this summer when I came by, it just looked great and it looked perfect and it was the year to take it. When the spruce was unveiled as the 2020 tree, the Rockefeller team got to work protecting and preparing it. We had a 24 hour a day guard. Eric especially, he's been here every day. There's been like family, we're gonna miss them being outside every day. But getting this massive spruce to the center of Manhattan is no easy task. First, it had to come out of the ground. We came up and we started tying it. It took us all the way to Saturday afternoon. Eric hired a crew of local workers to tie up the branches. That's to make sure they're secure through the cutting and the drive. And then the crane came and we built the crane and put the counterweights on it so that it could hold the tree. The crane is already attached to the tree when the workers begin cutting. Eric and his team have private property and bystanders to think about. It takes only a few minutes to saw through the massive trunk, leaving the giant tree hanging in the air. Now we moved it over to the truck. The tree is laid on its side on that 115 foot long trailer and strapped into place. The tree is going to take a nice little trip down in New York City. Often the most complicated part is getting it right from the property where it is onto the highway. What is normally a three and a half hour drive takes up to three days with the 75 foot tree. You don't want to get the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree stuck in traffic. And then of course the city of New York is always tremendously helpful with us in terms of closing the streets and making sure that we're able to have a smooth arrival into the city. Normally, the tree arrives to big crowds, but this year, because of COVID-19, it pulled up to an empty Rockefeller Center. We like to think that Tree Arrival Day is the start of the holiday season officially in New York. And certainly this has been a year unlike any other, so it felt all the more important to us to continue those traditions. Carefully, it's lifted off the truck, then tilted right side up and slid into the sturdy tree stand in the middle of Rockefeller Center. As if putting up the tree in Rockefeller Plaza is not enough. Crew is working on the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree got a little surprise. They found a tiny owl. This year, workers found a little owl hidden inside the tree. And the bird went viral as people guessed it hitched a ride all the way from upstate New York. He was brought safely to a shelter and named appropriately Rockefeller, Rocky for short. Also blowing up the internet, the fact that the tree looked a little bare on arrival. But what might look like a scrawny tree now got a big facelift. This is the extension to make it nice and full. Over the next couple of weeks, the tree was surrounded in scaffolding. As the tree's branches settled and fluffed out, it's been reported workers also attached branch extensions to make the tree appear fuller. We would stick a hole in the tree, put the branch back in, boom, wire it in, boom. It's like a weave. Like a weave. Oh, like yes. a weave. It's just, like it's a just weave. like a weave. Then they draped 50,000 LED lights around it and topped it with a 900 pound Swarovski crystal star. And finally, on December 2nd, the Rockefeller Christmas tree is lit up. This year, through a virtual ceremony. The tree is always real. Come, you can smell it, you can see it. This year, we probably won't let you touch it, thanks to, uh, to COVID, but I, I can assure you, it is a very real tree. We have the pine cones to prove it. And when it's all over, we take the lumber when it is done and we turn it, we donate to Habitat for Humanity and it turns into homes for the future.